Okay, good evening everyone. My name is Dr. Nasser Ali and uh, on behalf of uh, YPS, um, I'd like to welcome you to this very important webinar. Uh, we've been actually organizing these webinars now for almost five, six months or so. And uh, these have been organized by uh, Young Professional Society. And uh, you, the Young Professional Society has been set up to help uh, the youth, the young people with personal and professional development and we focus on three areas. Firstly, communication, leadership, and innovation. And uh, during the last five months or so, uh, we've been regularly on a weekly basis, uh, bringing you webinars given by different professionals from all around the world, leading experts in their field, who are there to sort of share their experience um, and inform the youngsters about the field that they're in. Um, and talk a bit about their experiences just to help the youngsters. Um, and we've been working with our collaborators uh, on these webinar series um, who are STEM matters, who are based in the USA. Um, and um, so on a weekly basis, every weekend there's at least two webinars. And uh, this webinar is the, la the last webinar for 2020, yeah? So uh, hopefully we'll be bringing new webinars on in, the, in the next year. But although this is the last one, we've we've kept the last for the for, for the best. Um, the last. So uh, we're very very sort of um, pleased to have uh, Dr. Maya Zavi with us today, and uh, she will be speaking about uh, women in science, very very important topic. And uh, just to sort of introduce briefly our. Um, Speaker Dr. May Zawi is a reader and an associate professor in uh, physiology and nanomedicine in the Faculty of Science and uh, Engineering at the Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, she's the deputy lead of the cardio cardiovascular research team and pathway lead uh, within the sci scientific training program. She has extensive research and teaching experience at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels within the physiological and the biomedical sciences. She's actually the fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK and, and she's published widely in international journals. Dr. Azawi is an elected committee member of the British Society for Cardiovascular Research, a trustee of the British Society for Nanomedicine and has served as chair for a number of international conferences including Nanomedicine, Nanomed in uh, 2018, um, she's a, the BAME representative for the uh, Athena Swan team and BAME faculty task group member for the Racy College Charter at Manchester Metropolitan University. So um, the format of uh, today's webinar, Dr. Maya Zawi will speak for up to 40 minutes or so. And then after that, uh, we'll have some, an opportunity for Q&A. So if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask, Dr. Maya Zawi, then please do type them in in the chat box. And um, if, a peop if people are joining us on the Facebook live stream, and if you've got any questions for Dr. Azawi, then please do type them in the comment box. And then at the end, Dr. Azawi will be answering your question. So over to you, Dr. May. Uh, good evening. Um, I'd like to thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. Uh, I, I'm delighted to be able to do so. Uh, the aim of my talk is to empower and support university students and early career researchers to progress in science and also to inspire secondary school girls to become our scientists of the future. Um, so working as a scientist is very exciting and is a very rewarding career. You get to make discoveries and help to diagnose and treat disease. Um, the current pandemic has highlighted what an important role science and uh, scientists play in our lives. Um, so working as a female scientist, however, is not without challenges. Um, if we look at some statistics, we find that women make up around 12% of the UK uh, STEM workforce. Few women with degrees in science um, continue with their studies further to master's and PhD levels. Um, and if we look at career progression, the percentage of women in top jobs is very small. 
and this number is even smaller for ethnic minority uh, women. So a, a very recent study that was published this year uh, was carried out uh, by Fatima and colleagues. Uh, this illustrates nicely the range of challenges that are faced by women scientists. Um, so the lack of uh, homework balance is identified by nearly 40% um, of, uh, 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 of the women who took part in the study. Um, and um, this is followed by discrimination and lack of opportunity in the workplace. Um, so it's not all gloom and in this talk, um, I will share with you my journey as a scientist over the many years, and I will reflect back on lessons learned and the coping strategies that I adopted to maintain a career in science. Um, I will then move on to describe our, our current research and give you some insight into the working life of a scientist to help inspire our young girls to pursue a career in science. Um, so my journey as a scientist began many years ago, back in the early 90s when I was studying for my PhD at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London. Um, I already had a, an undergraduate degree and a master's in immunology and I was keen to pursue a career in research. So at the Royal Brompton Hospital, I was working as part of a group, um, scientists and clinicians to look at the mechanisms that lead to asthma and why some people uh, have sensitive airways and respond poorly to treatment. So we collected biopsies from asthmatic individuals and we analyzed these samples and we looked at the cell types that were infiltrating the airways. So I worked uh, as part of a group to discover that actually some of these cells were activated and they released mediators that recruited other cell types into the airway lining. So what you can see here is a light microscopy image of a tissue section from an asthmatic airway. Uh, and you can see lots of cells that actually infiltrate the uh, lining epithelial layer. And if we use special stains, we notice that actually some of these cells, in particular the eosinophils, are actually activated. So these are the arrows here. So this was seminal work that became the basis of current drug treatment for severe asthmatics, so the anti-IL-5s. And I would say that this research instilled a passion for me uh, to continue research because of the impact uh, the, uh, that was very evident on the lives and well-being of people. So um, if you're interested in postgraduate research, then look for a topic that inspires you. Um, because for most disciplines within the biomedical sciences, um, you will have uh, be able to gain transferable skills uh, and you will be able to uh, progress in, in the field that you are interested in. Um, after my PhD, I relocated to Manchester where I spent many years doing postdoctoral training. So, um, Postdoctoral training is very important for a career in science. Uh, for me at the time, there, was, there were no research opportunities uh, in asthma in Manchester, uh, but I was uh, able to apply the knowledge and also learn some uh, molecular skills to look at immune cells and mediators that affected pathogenesis of, of cardiovascular disease. So again, I spent many happy hours looking under the microscope and quantifying cells that infiltrated the heart muscle. Um, one important observation that we made was that even in the normal uh, heart, there were cells that were infiltrating and trafficking to the myocardium, which is the muscle tissue. And that these blood vessels, so there's a picture of a blood vessel here at an HNE scheme, uh, HNE stain for those of you who are familiar uh, with these stains. Um, and uh, uh, it is evident that um, in this cross section, um, there are these brown cells, that these are the macrophages that were infiltrating the cells. So, um, this really represents a snapshot view of what is a very dynamic process. 
Um, and so um, during the course of, of my period as a postdoc, I went away on, on maternity leave. And during that time, I was able to reflect back and assess the approaches I was using. Uh, and after a, a two year career break, I was keen to get back to work and I was ready for a new challenge. I remember very vividly my first exposure to vascular physiology. Uh, this was back in uh, 2001 when I visited the Department of Medicine at the University of Manchester. And I was fascinated by an ongoing experiment at the time using a technique called pressure myography. So this technique involves um, isolating and stringing up short sections of blood vessels and bathing them in gas uh, salt solution so that they stay uh, viable or alive. And as a visual person, I was excited by the fact that I could observe in real time the changes in blood vessel diameter as the vessel constricted and relaxed to different drugs and solutions. So this was a great opportunity for me to use a whole system of systems approach, um, a functional approach to investigate the role of blood vessels in cardiovascular disease. And so I took that opportunity. Um, but I was only able to work part time because my children were still very young. Um, so part time employment is now uh, becoming more popular for young mothers. Uh, it is now more widely available and many employers uh, allow for flexible working hours. So this is this is a, this is a great thing. Um, also worth noting that um, some grant awarding bodies uh, have funding specifically for women uh, wanting to return uh, after a career break. So these are career re-entry fellowships uh, that, are, uh, that are available by uh, funding bodies like the Wellcome Trust and the Daphne Jackson Trust. Um, so having completed my postdoctoral training um, uh, uh, over quite a long period of time, because obviously I had to juggle family and, and work, um, I was able to uh, uh, then apply for um, uh, an academic position, um, but I realized that I really needed a, a teaching qualification in order to apply competitively. Uh, and sure enough, uh, doing a PG cert uh, qualification for higher education helped me to secure a lectureship at Manmet in, in 2006. Uh, and again, this was done as uh, uh, on part time basis, um, um, uh, which helped me to cope with family commitments. Um, so um, the lectureship role uh, involved uh, a, a substantial part of uh, teaching and admin. Um, leading courses uh, in physiology and maintaining a research group. So, so um, lectureship positions can be a little bit challenging, can be hard work. Hard work. Um, so in addition to the supervisions and the teaching, it's also a case of applying for external funding and also disseminating the research findings at conferences and, 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 and writing papers. Um, so um, I'm going to just now move on and tell you a little bit more about the current research um, uh, in my lab. Um, so we're interested in the mechanisms that lead to cardiovascular disease and how we can prevent heart attacks. So um, cardiovascular disease is a major cause of death worldwide and people from ethnic minorities are at an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease. Now the heart is a very active organ. So a healthy heart will pump about five liters of blood uh, per minute. And during vigorous exercise, it can pump up to 40 liters of blood per minute. And this blood is distributed to every organ and cell in the body by a very rich network of blood vessels. Now, we've come to learn that these blood vessels don't simply 
supply uh, the, uh, the, the organs. They, are, um, they don't act as simple tubes, but actually they are able to actively re regulate their diameter uh, to ensure that the blood supply is matched to demand. And the very small size arteries can control more than half of that blood supply. And so the walls of these vessels, if we look closely, have a thick middle layer of smooth muscle cells. And these are lined by a thin layer of what we call the endothelial cells. So these, these are delicate cells. And these cells play a very important role in homeostasis because they release a range of mediators. Uh, and so in disease states, um, um, there's an imbalance in the mediators that are released, and this is what we call endothelial dysfunction. Um, and uh, endothelial dysfunction is associated uh, with cardiovascular diseases and associated risk factors like high blood pressure, but also in, age, in aging. So as we get older, uh, uh, and also if these vessels are injured. And this is when we accumulate oxidative substances. Um, so it's a very complicated set of processes within our cells. Um, and this is why uh, eating a healthy diet full of fruit of, and veg is very important because we can uh, counteract these oxidative mechanisms uh, by uh, using uh, these substances that contain antioxidants. Um, so um, the aim of our group's work is to preserve and restore blood vessel function. And so we use a number of strategies in order to achieve this. So we're interested in natural substances and antioxidants that are found in fruit and veg to help support blood vessel function. We're interested in patient-led interventions like exercise for cardiovascular rehab patients after surgery. Um, we're also interested in, in uh, how we can use scaffolds in end stage disease so that we can replace the diseased vessels. Um, and we're also interested in testing the effect of nanoparticles to see how um, we can modify them so that they don't actually injure the vessels when they are used for imaging. But I guess quite importantly for us, we want to be able to use uh, these nanoparticles as drug delivery modalities in order to deliver drugs directly to diseased blood vessels and avoid any drug side effects. Um, and so therefore, in order to answer key questions in physiological sciences, it's important to use a number of approaches. And one important approach is to use human clinical studies and interventions. And so it's possible to uh, measure the diameter of a patient's blood vessel directly using the ultrasound machine. Uh, and this is what we call the reactive hyperemia. And so we can test how these blood vessels respond before and after the, the, uh, they, are, uh, inge they ingest uh, certain substances. Um, and so uh, we uh, measure what is known as flow-mediated dilation. Um, now, um, in order to test new drugs, uh, obviously, we can't test them on the humans, and therefore, there are other approaches that are used in physiological sciences, and these uh, include looking at isolated cells in culture, but also looking at isolated vessels. Um, and so, um, to do this kind of work, this will involve dissecting blood vessels under a microscope and then mounting them uh, uh, um, within fine steel wires to keep them in a, in a viable state. Uh, and so uh, this is some of the work that the disease is doing as part of her, her PhD work. Um, uh, Kai recently completed his PhD. He also uh, looked at isolated blood vessels and used the pressure myography technique 
in order to look at the effects of various substances uh, on the functionality of the vessels. And so these are some of the, some of the outputs. Um, and so the work really involves assessing lots and lots of traces and um, doing some calculations and assessing percentage dilation in response to cumulative doses of the drugs. So science is really about networking and uh, it's really become clear and very popular now uh, to uh, engage in, in, in inter or multidisciplinary collaboration because this can help, help us in solving uh, unanswered questions. Um, so back in 1959, there's a famous physicist uh, called Richard Feynman who gave a famous lecture called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And this is about man manipulating matter at the atomic scale. So nanoparticles are really tiny structures that are about the size of viruses, and these can enter cells and influence cell function. Um, I was exposed to nanotechnology by serendipity. Um, I shared an office with a chemist who was making these nanoparticles. And so we were interested in, in testing those on our blood vessels. And we noticed that um, when we infuse the blood vessels with the nanos, that they were very quickly taken up by these uh, lining endothelial cells. So this is an electron micrograph of uh, a blood vessel wall. And here is a, a, a higher image of a uh, higher magnification of a single endothelial cell. So there's a nucleus in the middle. And what you can see here is these are the individual uh, silica nanoparticles. These are the dark spherical structures. Um, and uh, so uh, therefore uh, we set out to use different types of nanos and we're particularly interested uh, in using those as drug delivery modalities. Um, and so um, here are some uh, uh, different types of nanos uh, that, 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 that are quite attractive to use. So these are mesoporous silica nanoparticles. So these have got lots of holes. They are soaked with the drugs. They're very quickly taken up. Um, what is possible to do is to actually um, cap those with various polymers and then allow um, these polymers to break up uh, in response to various substances so that um, the drug is, uh, is released when, uh, when triggered by high pHs or oxidative stress, for example. So this is stimulus responsive triggered release. Uh, and this is actually quite attractive. But this kind of research becomes possible when you actually collaborate with uh, people from other disciplines uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore it becomes very exciting. Um, nanostructured lipid, lipid carriers are, are very attractive because they are ingestible and they cross the blood brain barrier and it means that you can actually use those to look at uh, cerebrovascular disease. And so hopefully uh, I've given you some insight into the range of techniques and approaches that we use to help us answer some important questions. Um, some uh, students ask me what qualities they need uh, in order to become a scientist. Um, so, so here's a, a list, but please don't be put off by this long list um, because often qualities are developed and nurtured over time. Um, I guess one of the most important qualities is to be passionate and, and curious. So passion is wanting to make a difference, working for a purpose. Um, so science is driven by unanswered questions. Uh, so we devise a hypothesis um, based on our current knowledge, uh, and then we assess that using experimental means. Uh, ambitious and persistent. Um, so experiments can take a long time. Um, they don't always work. So for example, looking at pressure myography, the success rate for that uh, is about 70%. So out of 10 experiments, seven will work, but three will not. And so it's a case of actually being 
patient and, and being persistent. Um, of course, uh, organization is very important uh, because you need to plan experiments ahead of time uh, and make sure that all the necessary experimental controls are there and that all the reagents are ordered in time. Uh, and when you do get results, uh, then you have to be able to analyze those carefully uh, and um, uh, always, uh, uh, rather than often, you will need to do and carry out some statistical analysis using various packages. Being a problem solver um, is very important, obviously, because things don't always work the way that we plan. Uh, so therefore we have to be creative and think out of the box uh, and to be able to solve problems in a different way using an alternative approach perhaps. Um, being a team worker is very important. Um, it's not possible to answer a scientific question on your own uh, using a single approach. And often uh, we work as part of a, a team of scientists uh, from different disciplines looking at different aspects. Um, and so nanomedicine is, is really one example, so that we work with chemists who synthesize the nanoparticles, they characterize them, and then we test them uh, using cell cultures, uh, ex vivo and, and vivo experiments. Um, being a communicator is important because once you have all your data, you will want to communicate your findings and you will want to pass on the knowledge um, to the scientific and the medical community through uh, learned journals and, and conferences, but also you want to communicate that to the general public. Um, and this uh, is possible at science festivals, uh, to school children, but also through outreach activities and, uh, and science clubs. So therefore, uh, just to give you some examples, um, Working as a team uh, is really important. It's helped us achieve many unanswered questions. And this is the case for all science groups. So here are some pictures of postgraduate students and postdoctoral staff who've worked long and hard hours in order to get the results uh, and to make a contribution to our field of study. Uh, and because the work is uh, multidisciplinary, we collaborate widely with internal and external uh, staff members um, from different fields uh, and from different disciplines. Uh, and we also collaborate with uh, obviously uh, the different universities and also with industry. Um, communicating the science is, uh, is the fun part. Uh, because we get to go to uh, conferences um, uh, across the globe. Um, we get to write articles in journals. Uh, and so here are some uh, images of, uh, of the uh, uh, NanoMed uh, conference that was organized by NanoSmat. So this was held at, at Manchester a couple of years ago. Um, we also do fun activities with primary and uh, school uh, uh, secondary school children at science festivals. So here's a, an undergraduate student uh, who developed a, a vascular model. So this was part of her final, uh, final year project. Um, she developed the model further uh, and this model was then uh, uh, being used by staff and students who took this model to different schools uh, and this helped to communicate the role of the blood vessels and the role of maintaining the blood flow to prevent cardiovascular disease. Um, so how do you become a scientist? Um, there are a number of routes to a science uh, career. And there are many disciplines, of course, such as uh, physiology. Um, and so um, after doing a degree, so this can be in physiology or a related subject, um, it's possible to carry out further study, uh, to do a master's um, or to do a PhD. Um, uh, 
uh, and this will involve largely conducting research. There are some, some taught master's courses. Sometimes individuals may not be clear exactly which sort of discipline they're interested in. And so a taught master's can have a breadth of information that can help uh, that, that can help decide and it will have a short uh, period of uh, a research project so a three-month project uh, and that means that the individual can then decide is is further research something that they want to get into or not so doing an MRes or doing a PhD uh, and then after that uh, there would be a, a period of doing postdoctoral research uh, which will provide additional training um, there are research fellowships and research professorships, so people who want to stay in research, that is possible. Um, it is possible to go into academia um, and get tenured positions and become academic tutors, but there are also uh, non-academic careers. Um, and so, you know, doing medical writing, uh, being involved in, in, in public engagement. Um, so, uh, uh, in addition to that, it's possible to actually uh, work in healthcare and become a clinical physiologist. So uh, I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so um, a number of years ago, um, the Modern Modernizing Scientific Careers Initiative was launched. Uh, and this meant that students who were studying clinical physiology could study further and uh, become consultant clinical scientists in the hospitals. And so, uh, so this is one of the courses that we do at ManMet and um, uh, people, uh, students can apply for the practitioner training program uh, uh, via a number of, of, of pathways. So uh, they can uh, specialize as cardiac physiologists, as respiratory and sleep physiologists, as neurophysiologists. Um, it's also possible to do this as part of an apprenticeship program, which means that individuals can actually be working in the hospital and they'd have day release, come into the university once a week. Of course, it's all online now. And so uh, it means that they'll be able to attend uh, uh, these lectures online. But of course, these courses also have an important uh, element of placement. So for a three year program, um, it is possible to do um, placement. So students will go out on placement um, and they will in fact during this, uh, this pandemic. So in the first year they do 10 weeks, uh, in the second year they do 15 weeks. Uh, part of this is over the summer and uh, they spend a substantial amount of time in their final year uh, of, of, of that course. And so um, what you learn in physiology, if you are doing a, a healthcare program, or if you're doing a degree in physiology, for example, you will do a lot of the basic sciences and studying physiological systems. You will gain transferable skills um, that can include research skills and employability. Um, and you get to obviously uh, uh, spend uh, much, much time in the laboratory and also doing a research project uh, in the final year. Um, and so um, for those of you who are in secondary schools, um, if you're interested in doing science, then you can attend um, science fairs uh, and career events to develop uh, the passion. So there are lots of STEM activities and there are STEM clubs. So now there are online STEM clubs that are available that you can attend. Um, if you are at university um, uh, and even uh, if you're in secondary school, you can apply for work experience and placements. So the Nuffield Foundation do uh, uh, research placements and you can inquire about that from your science teacher. Um, uh, you can uh, apply for a, a membership of a, a, of a learned society. So the Physiological Society, for example, uh, allow individuals to become affiliate members. So they're not ordinary members, but affiliate members. And there's a reduced fee for that. I think actually for 
um, the affiliate membership, it, it might even be free, but um, I, I could double check that for you if you're interested. Uh, British Society for Nanomedicine, so becoming a member is free. Uh, so it's free membership for the, for the public, but also for, for, for scientists. And I guess finally, um, keeping abreast of the literature is very important. So lots and lots of reading. Um, so new scientists, various websites. Uh, so keeping, keep, keeping that interest. Um, and so um, to conclude, um, I hope uh, that uh, you have found some inspiration um, from my story uh, to, to follow your passion. Um, the findings uh, from um, the recent study by Fatima and, and colleagues that I, I, I mentioned at the outset um, looked at coping strategies uh, of uh, female scientists and they found that um, the uh, coping strategy adopted by most, uh, 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 by many of them, uh, is it will include self-confidence, uh, hard work and dedication. So self-confidence and empowerment is really very important, uh, but also a supportive work and home environment uh, to help with the work-life balance. Um, so much of this really resonates with me, and I have certainly learned uh, that actually it's very important to be flexible. Um, uh, it's very important to network widely, uh, especially at uh, a multidisciplinary level, and to take up the challenge. Um, now, getting a mentor is always very, very empowering, and I would highly recommend that. Um, so some people can act as mentors and, and others can be sponsors. So this a sponsor would be within your discipline and would act be actively supporting you. Um, so um, obviously times can be tough. So therefore uh, mentors and sponsors can support you when, when, when the going gets tough uh, because really life is in phases. Um, and that is important to, to really remember. Uh, and I guess finally, my message to you uh, in the spirit of the Feynman lecture uh, is really that there is plenty of room at the top. Um, so um, uh, uh, reach out uh, for your dream and, uh, and take up the challenge. Uh, so thank you, uh, th thank you very much for listening uh, and thank you for, for, for the opportunity um to, to 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 speak to you today thank you very much thank you very much dr maya zawi for an excellent lecture uh, i'm sure everyone found this um, beneficial um now we will have um q a session so i know already we have a number of questions so if you do have any questions for dr may please do feel free um to type them in the chat box or if you're watching us on facebook to uh, type them in, in the comments box. box. Um, so I think I'll, I'll ask a few questions, but I'll also ask Professor Ahmed to co-chair this Q&A so you can maybe go through some of the questions that are in the chat box. But um, firstly, uh, Dr. May, uh, do you have to have a PhD to become a scientist? I know you mentioned that, you know, the PhD could take three to four years or so on, so especially for some of the females. A female, you know, is quite a long, you know, is too long. So, is it essential to have the PhD? Um, the short answer is is no. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it is not essential. You you, you can work as a scientist, um, having had a, a degree in in a science discipline. Um, but what I can say is that um, a PhD. Uh, uh, is is a training uh, post. So what a master's and a PhD degree do is provide you with further training. Um, so it is not it is not essential. Um, but but if if you are interested in uh, uh, continuing a career, um, obviously depending on where you want to go, then then uh, the, the PhD can be supportive. 
I know that certainly for some um, universities, for many universities, uh, lectureship positions um, that actually involve a lot of a, a, a lot of science work require a PhD. Okay. Do you feel that there are few females who go on to study at PhD level in, in the scientific uh, subject? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and this is what the statistics shows, that uh, because of the uh, uh, family commitments for a lot of the females and because of the responsibilities that they have, it is actually very difficult because doing a PhD is a commitment. But like I said, one very important message is that life is in phases. And so if it is not possible for you to do a PhD at this moment in time, you know, there may be an opportunity in the future. It depends on, you know, if, uh, uh, if the person has a family or not. Uh, you know, as the kids get older, there will be more time. And of course, PhDs don't have to be carried out on a full-time basis, they can be carried out on a part-time basis. Yeah, and then there's also a lot of youngsters, yeah, it could be you know, both male and female, who get put off by, you know, to, to do PhDs because they hear that there's a lot of people who, with PhDs find it difficult to get postdocs or academic positions. What would you advise on that? Or what would you say? Um, so I'm not sure if I've actually got, I've got, got if I've actually understood, yeah. do you mean whether doing a PhD would hinder them getting further positions? No, it's not that, you know, uh, some of the youngsters get put off uh, to do PhDs because they they see that there's quite a number of uh, people who do PhDs, but then they struggle to get on to, to get an academic position or even a postdoc. So they think probably, okay, let's just do a, a master's or so and then work. Yeah, I mean, if the primary goal is actually to gain a uh, employment, then obviously, depending on what that employment is, then then yes, go and find out exactly what is required. So becoming a science communicator, being a public engagement officer, um, then that uh, certain lines of uh, of careers, certain careers may not uh, require it. It may not be essential for that, um, but um, it may be essential for some and not others. Okay, we're just going to take a question. I believe this is from a student or somebody who's just uh, graduated. The COVID has stopped my research. I was looking for a postdoctoral position, but I failed to get. The year 2020 was extremely hard. Uh, to, for me, no grant, no work, and no research. After getting my doctorate on 28th December 2019, one year has lost at home. Yeah, um, I, I very much empathize with that. Um, it, it has been a very difficult year um, for scientists in particular. I know that um, for many of the universities, it is possible to, to continue the research. We have to observe social distancing and therefore time in the laboratory may be shortened as a consequence. Um, but I would say have patience, uh, you will be able to get back to the lab. This is uh, an inter, this is a, 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 a I would say a, a short time, hopefully, um, and things may and hopefully will get back to normal. Um, what I've encouraged my students to do is to actually um, spend the time constructively um, writing their PhDs, starting to do, to do the write-up, the methodologies, um, writing papers, communicating the science. And so I think it would be good to actually think about what else it is that you can do remotely when you're not in the laboratory, analyzing data. Uh, you'd be amazed if you look critically at the data that you've collected, how you can actually analyze them and actually answer some of key questions that you might have. Doing uh, systematic reviews uh, or writing uh, literature reviews is also um, something that you could also do.
Um, okay, so great. I'm happy to um, to obviously provide further support if if, if you feel that, that 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 you'd like some some advice. Yeah, there's another question. Are there any opportunity for part-time PhDs? Yes, uh, it is possible. So um, uh, depending on um, which institution you're interested in applying to, that is something very possible. What I would suggest that you do is actually contact the uh, um, uh, academic member of staff um, whose area you're interested in going into and, and uh, actually uh, 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 asking them for details, but it is absolutely very possible to actually do do it on a part-time basis, yes. Yeah. And, and generally, is it um, funding an issue to support your scientific research projects in that? Is that... Uh... Yeah, yeah, funding, uh, funding can be an issue, absolutely. It's become a lot more difficult uh, in this current climate because of the pandemic. Um, many of the research charities have cut back and it means that many of the calls are no longer being advertised by some of the grant awarding bodies. And so therefore applying for funding has become even more competitive than it used to be. Um, Which so it is, it is difficult. Would you say that that now that Brexit's happened, does that mean more funding for R and D? Um, I, I I can't answer that. Um, I, I I guess I'm not in a position to be able to uh, to answer that. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, we've got some other questions as well. Dr. Ahmed, do you want to read some of them, or um, there, there's a list of. Um, There's a question from uh, Yasmin about the pay difference between men and women. What is it like in as a re in research or academia? Um, I am not aware of of, uh, of a gap in that regard. Um, I guess it really depends on what what grading you're at, what grading you're employed at. Yeah, I think I can answer that one as well. Yeah. Uh, I think basically, that as long as you're in the right grade, there's no difference between uh, male and female in terms of pay differences. Yeah. Yeah, well, while we're on that payment issue, um, the question is, is being a scientist well paid? Uh, I, I guess that's subjective. Do you agree, uh, Professor Walker? We had, a, Dr. May, we had a, um, a senior politician we interviewed uh, a few weeks or months ago, and uh, somebody asked the same question, is a politician well paid? He says, uh, well, if you want to um, think about earning money, then don't become a politician, do something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I can say one thing, and that is, um, you know, scientists don't do science for the money. They're not in it for the money. Yes, you know, when this um, COVID thing happened, there was a, a scientist I, I saw there's, um, uh, on one of the social media posts and um, a Spanish scientist. And they said, oh, people who want, uh, they're looking for this vaccine, yeah? They said, oh, go and, go and ask uh, Ronaldo or Messi, yeah? Because they get, you know, paid in millions, yeah, to develop this vaccine where scientists are being underpaid. So, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. There are also many people who've done a science, science degree who are multi-billionaires. So Elon Musk, for example, has got a science degree and he's probably one of the richest men in the world. And uh, look, look at uh, the Pfizer scientist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, 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 of Turkish origin, and uh, he's uh, doing very well. While we're on that Pfizer vaccine, uh, there's a lot of people who are scared, you know, to, to take this uh, vaccine. What would you say on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand the apprehension, absolutely. And, and I guess... Really, the, the, the issue that many people have is, is the fact that actually 
Um, the long-term effects are obviously not known because the, uh, 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 the uh, phase three trials uh, and they were, when they were trialed on the humans, um, it was a, 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 sh a very short period of time. Um, but um, um, these um, are really RNA uh, that are really smuggled into the inside. So certainly in terms of the Pfizer uh, vaccine, they're smuggled inside of the cell uh, using the lipid structures. So this is nanomaterial really. And so it simply gets the cell to actually make this S protein so that the body is able to actually see it and mount an immune response against it. So it's uh, supporting the body's functionality in enabling that immune response. Yeah, th there was a question, yeah. how, is, how is nanotechnology helping develop COVID vaccines? Yeah, that's exactly mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, that's exactly how. Professor Norman, do you want to see through some of these other questions? Um, uh, how important do you think uh, cultural background is in science? For example, for me, if somebody says to me, and any whatever it is, or oh, you can't do this, my brain clicks into a different gear, and I think. I can do this. So if somebody tells me to motivate me, if somebody says you can't do it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so how important do you think yeah. cultural background is and the attitudes to succeed in science? Yeah, absolutely. There, there has to be the want. There, there, there has to be, um, you know, being able to rise up to the challenge. Um, you know, that that is important. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of culture um, and ethnicity, uh, yes, you know, there are challenges, you know, one cannot deny that. And I think, you know, um, recently the um, race equality charter um, is, you know, is really being uh, taken up by many, um, uh, institutions. So this is a national scheme uh, aimed at improving the representation and the progression and the success of minority ethnic staff and students within higher education. Um, and so it's important to, to actually be aware of that. Um, so um, yeah, uh, ethnicity, you know, is, you know is, is, is an important point to, to, to be considering. Okay, also, uh, Dr. May, due to this uh, COVID, a lot of this sort of teaching has gone online. How effective yeah. do you think online teaching is? And is that something you think that could possibly become a norm or so? Or? Um, I think there's going to be obviously a lot of um, assessment. So um, quality control and assessment to ensure actually that all of the learning outcomes are actually met by actually doing the online teaching. And so therefore, um, lecturers are working very hard to ensure that actually this is the case. Uh, and so there's a lot of learning material that actually uh, uh, supplied for the students. There is online learning. And so there can be a slight shift, if you say. Now there's a shift to empowering the individual for self-directed learning so they can actually take ownership of their own learning. So this is actually a positive thing, not a negative thing. Um, and yeah, so- can I, can I just the, ask, uh, who were your role models growing up? Uh, who inspired you to get into science and in this field? Um, who's inspired me? Yes. Um, I think, yeah, that's um, yes. I've I've not really thought very much um, um, about kind of individuals who I guess will have inspired me. But I guess really my teachers, my secondary school teachers, primary school teachers. Um, it's the passion, having the passion uh, when they were passionate teaching me. Uh, that that was great inspiration, I would say. 
Yeah. In yeah, some fields, you yeah. have to start off very young to be good at something. So, for example, if you want to be a musician, uh, maybe you have to start when you're three, four, five, six, or a golfer. Um, in I, science, I, uh, is that the case in science? Uh, no, not really. I wouldn't say because we have examples uh, of students who, who are actually um, at Manet. Uh, who are mature students so they start their career very late on so they have family commitments uh, they wait until their children have grown up and then they start their courses on a part-time basis or full-time basis and I know some excellent examples of, of students who have actually um, you know uh, completed their degrees very successfully uh, and got some excellent jobs in, in healthcare and, and also in academia. So it is very possible to actually um, start late if you have the interest, if you have the passion uh, and the commitment, then there is absolutely no reason um, why, why you cannot pursue your interests. So really, I mean, age is just a number. It doesn't matter when you start really. Okay, there's the question there, Dr. May. What are your future ambitions? So I, I see that you're, you're a leader at the moment, so naturally you would want to progress to, to the professorship. Or, um. Yeah, perhaps. I guess, um, I, I guess what I find more important is actually passing on that knowledge mm -hmm. um, as, uh, you know, as, as a key ambition that I have. Um, the lessons that I have learned, uh, empowering the people around me. Um, so I am within the professoriate team and I have the responsibility of actually uh, what they call substantial responsibility for research. Uh, that responsibility will not change very much. So where the reader or professor, professor levels is, is actually going to be similar, but, uh, but Passing on the knowledge, empowering the people around me. I think that is, that you know, that is how I would like to to support um, the uh, the people around. Uh, there's another question: Is there any work experience available for students um, to have an insight of the job and for the future opportunities? If they could sort of spend some time or so um, in the lab or so. Or Absolutely, absolutely. It is very difficult at the moment, uh, only because of the uh, social distancing that we're having to implement in the laboratories. But um, hopefully, um, by next year, things will have improved quite a bit, and we will be able to uh, 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 support that. You talked about some personal qualities uh, in your uh, presentation. How important is being resourceful to a scientist? Absolutely. Absolutely, I, I, would, uh, I would say that is very, very important because um, in science, um, sometimes it can be a bit of a yo-yo. So uh, up and down, uh, there can be some um, um, sort of very exciting days when you're in a high, when your experiments have worked really well. And there can be uh, days when you're feeling very down. So, you know, you can be spending months on, um, on a research grant proposal uh, that's maybe worth half a million and you put all your efforts into it. And because of the competitive nature of, uh, of grant awards, the, 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 um, uh, the grant isn't successful. And uh, what it really means is that um, there isn't the money uh, to, to fund that research. The research uh, uh, proposal might be excellent. It might be uh, 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 worth pursuing, but there, isn't, um, but there isn't the money. And so therefore uh, it's important to, uh, to smile and carry on. Okay. What okay. about uh, leadership? How important is leadership in science? Absolutely, I would say leadership is actually quite important. Um, uh, you know, leadership is, uh, 
is important, but equally uh, being able to actually work as part of a team is as important. Um, so um, if, if individuals are interested in uh, progression uh, for their career, then uh, the application for progression uh, will uh, mean that you would have to uh, demonstrate leadership skills as well as team working skills and what is known as academic citizenship and being able to support the people around you, the staff and the students. What is the difference between industrial research and academic research? Yeah, so I think as the name goes, it, with industrial research, obviously it's targeted towards um, a given end product. So um, this is very different from the academic research that is done. And so therefore, you know, if it is the promotion of a product, the promotion of, um, so I, just to give you an example, we worked with an industrial collaborator who was actually interested in testing out a kit. So ultimately it is proving the suitability of that kit for research purposes so that, that more of those can actually be sold. And so therefore um, it can mean that if a certain area of research has no uh, uh, monetary end product, it might mean that the end of that research is slightly different in academia. Yeah, one of the areas that YPS focuses on is innovation. How important is innovation in, in, in your lab? And, and, and do you encourage um, people to just sort of conduct research, write papers, or sort of also to file patents and then, you know, uh, look at sort of spin out companies and things like that? Uh, yes, absolutely. So we have got uh, a research and enterprise department at, uh, at, at our university encouraging um, ideas, fresh ideas, um, and uh, obviously uh, developing patents, uh, if, 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 you know, if, if that is relevant. I think it's going to become uh, even more important uh, in the future for attracting funding for the government is always looking at we've yeah. given uh, that many millions of pounds to this research or this institution, what yeah. difference has it made to society. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, this uh, innovation and impact, yeah. it will become more and more imp important yeah. in the future. And uh, I think really, absolutely like you say, Professor Wakar, so really in the uh, sort of research assessment exercise, um, um, the, the, the REF or a research uh, framework, um, uh, impact is very important and it's demonstrating that impact really to the science community and to the wider social community as well. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's just past eight o'clock now. And I just want to ask a final question before we wrap up here. Now, if you could go back in time, Dr. Mayazawi, would you choose the same career or would you do something different? Um, I'd like to say that, uh, that maybe I'd do a different career, but I'd be lying to myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as hard as it's been, um, I think, you know, um, it, it, it is very exciting uh, to actually to be at the forefront, to be able to um, uh, discover, find out new things uh, that can actually help, uh, mm. help the community and the people around you. So, yeah, maybe I'll, yeah. There's an interesting question there. Yeah. Before uh, there's an interesting question from uh, Yasmin that says, "Do you think the country that leads in research will be the country that will lead the world?" Um, I, I, it, it's going to have to be. I think if uh, if there's any lesson that we've learned from the pandemic, <laughs> then uh, then maybe there's some truth in that. And I think Donald Trump keeps on saying science dictates. <laughs> 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 okay. 
Okay, so I think um, we're done with the questions. Uh, the time's up, it's just past eight o'clock. So Dr. Mayes, I will thank you very much for an excellent presentation. And um, thank you very much for everyone for joining today and also for, for your questions. And um, I think Dr. May has left an email there on the last slide. So if there's any additional uh, questions or so, I see there were a few people, some students or so who were thinking on just um, finished the PhD or wanting to do a PhD. And if you want to sort of ask more questions or so, you can do um, Dr. Azabi's um, email is in front of you. So um, hopefully, thank you very much for joining uh, during our, our, our webinars. And we look forward to uh, bringing more webinars in the new year. So in the meantime, wishing you a happy new year and stay safe. And uh, we look forward to meeting you or seeing you in, in the new year. And Dr. May Zavi, thank you very much. Anything you probably want to say as closing remarks as well? Well, um, well I think, um, well, firstly, thank you. Um, th thank you for having me. Uh, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and I really think that this Young Professional Society is really uh, an excellent uh, um, avenue really for our youngsters to, to really uh, join, to share, to share experiences. So uh, uh, well done. Thank you. Um, so um, thank you all for listening. Okay. Thank you very much and good night to everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.